All right, well, welcome to Fresh Life. We are so glad to have you here. And whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or the Church Online platform, it is such a pleasure to have you. Wanted to single out people in, uh, this week in Tanzania, in Ireland, in Turkey, in Italy, Nigeria, England, Argentina, Jamaica, Switzerland, South Africa, Peru, Dubai. Obviously, we know every week we have people joining us from all 50 states, but uh, we sometimes forget that God is doing a great thing all across the world. And so it is an honor to have you with us at this exact moment, no matter where you are. And if it's a labor of love with the time zone, that, I'm just pretty sure that means more in God's eyes. If you had to stay up late or get up early, that's got to be worth something. Uh, but really, it's exciting that with our church on demand, that you're able to, you know, I'm not saying don't join in now, because now there's a chat, and now you get to participate. And we're getting to see so many of you from so many different places every week. But if you ever do feel like, ah, oh, I slept in and missed the worship experience, you can catch the whole worship experience. We put that up every Monday on the Fresh Life YouTube page. And so much going on in the church uh, between our movement night coming up for the students students, junior high, high school, all across the country and world. If you want to log on to that movement night, we'd love to have you. Of course, we're seeing ladies plan these flourish nights as uh, we get so close to the 27th of October. We're having our flourish night with Christine Kane and my wife, Jenny. Uh, we're encouraging women to open up their homes and see the gospel shine forth into the relationships, the unique relationships in your life. Think about who do you work alongside? Who do you uh, live in a neighborhood alongside? Who do you get to know through your kid's school Zoom stress call every week that you have, or whatever it looks like, that you can say, hey, come over to my house. We're making some food. We're doing this, and then watching this webcast. And it's going to be a powerful night. We've, we're just seeing so many of these flourish events show up on our radar that people are planning, and we're believing God's going to use it in great ways. Well, this is week four of our Call of the Wild series. And if you have uh, a copy of the scriptures, we're going to be in James chapter 4. If you want to turn there to the New Testament book of James, we've been as a church community just anchoring our hearts this fall in this book of the Bible that we're studying on the weekends, but then we're each day reading little pieces of it, little hiding little, the, little gems from God's word into our, our souls. And it's been so powerful. And this week, I want to bring to you a message that I'm calling Get Outside. This is not just a message. This is a suggestion. This is a way of life. Get outside. According to the Harvard School of Public Health, on average, Americans spend 95% of their lives indoors. And when I read that, when I came across that statistic, that statistic, I had to do a double take to think about it. Because first of all, it's Harvard. So it's not like on Wikipedia, you know, like it's just someone threw it out there. Oh, you know, probably 95% of our lives. No, this is, this is a study done. This was, they tracked our, 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 our every waking moment. And they found out that nowadays in America, 2020, we spend on average 95% in this, in this culture of our lives indoors, cut off from nature. How this breaks down, you can see here on the, on the screen, uh, amounts to 65% of your life spent in your own home in your own uh, apartment or in your own condo or, or townhouse. 65% of your life is spent in your home, 25% in other buildings, other environments that are indoors. And then it goes to 5 to 7% cars, airplanes, subways, trains. And then 5%, just a meager 5% of the average American life is in the great outdoors. And so to set us up for uh, this conversation that James is going to tell us is, in fact, so good for your soul to get outside, I thought we would propel into this conversation uh, by spending just a few minutes listening to someone who defies this statistic for sure. I, I racked my brain and thought, who do I know who has spent more of the life? He's probably on the 5% indoors, 95% outdoor spectrum. And so this week, I had a chance to have a conversation uh, with wildlife enthusiast, animal expert, and zookeeper, Jack Hanna. Would you listen to this conversation? The one, the only, Jungle Jack Hanna. Wow. Folks, a king cobra. Okay. This animal can take down. This is remarkable. Well, 
Jack, I just wanted to say, first of all, how grateful I am to get to be friends with you. It's such an it, honor. Well, I don't know about that. But yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's been something with the animals because also when you have animals like that, and you see them in zoos, like I did all my life in Tennessee, and then went and built the whole big zoo in Columbus, Ohio. And then I get to go out and then see the animals in the wild and talk to the people that live with the animals. That's yeah, right. what really is, is something for me to do. It's awesome. Um, you were raised on a farm yeah, in Tennessee. Yeah, I sure was, in Tennessee, yes. On a hill, on a farm in Tennessee, yeah. And then that's when I started my animals. Did you spend a lot of time indoors, or were you mostly outside as a kid? Mostly outside. Oh, yeah, as a kid, yes. And then I actually took, um, <laughs> I found two beavers, and I put them in a box and took them to the school. I almost got kicked out. Yeah. Because I was going to do my speech like he did speeches in school. And I had them in a box and I was doing my speech, like getting ready to do my speech because I was going to do something totally different than other kids uh, and all that kind of stuff. Like one kid said he knew how to put windows in. You know what he did? He came to the, to the classroom, took a rock and threw right through the window in the, in the dadgum school. Went, crashed the whole window out. He thought that was something. Well, That's I, how he put windows in? He, 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 put, he windows, put the windows, windows in. That was his in. thing. Well, gotcha. I came out there with a big old animal in a box. And I was trying to just show, show the box, and all of a sudden the, the box started going, scratching everything out and got loose, and it just turned into a disaster. That was a beaver. My, my speech, yes. Now I understand, like you started uh, like a crazy rabbit colony as a kid. That kind of was one of the early forays into animals, right? You, you wanted to see these rabbits reproduce like crazy? Yeah, but you're right. But I didn't know they'd be breeding in the box when I'm trying to show the daggum animals. Oh, they got boy. there and started breeding, going, gotcha. like this, and I didn't a know what of... was going. So I'd open the thing up, and they were breeding in the box. Yes, just keep that private. Yeah, yeah, I will. And then you started, no, no, you don't have to keep it private. I'm saying you were trying to keep it private. Now, you, then you started like apprenticing for a veterinarian and you started kind of helping a vet out and doing whatever he wanted you to do? Yes, I did. I went to work for a veterinarian. I sure did. Cleaning cages, sweeping floors and all that kind of stuff. But then the whole key was, he said, Jack, I'm going to go. I just got appointed to go to the Knoxville, Tennessee Zoo. Uh, and so sure enough, oh, I'd love to go up there and see it with you. So I went up there and saw the zoo and everything, and I went home to my dad that night and said, Dad, I'm going to be a zookeeper. And my dad looked at me and he said, Jack, as long as you love it, that's fine. You went to college and everything else, and now you're going to work in a zoo. Yes, sir, I want to work in the zoo, clean cages and everything. So that's what led me to the whole thing of, of how the, the TV stuff started. I didn't even want to be on TV. They just came and looked at me at the zoo, and I was doing things like that. And then somehow uh, in New York City, Good Morning America, well, it was twin gorillas that we had, and I took them on the show there in, in New York. And then the next day, the David Letterman show calls, and they said, um, can, can you come here after you do the, the stuff on ABC in New York? Yeah, why not? I might as well do that too. And I didn't get paid any money. I said, as long as you say the Columbus Zoo, and I don't care about Jack Hanna, as long as you talk about our Columbus Zoo, I'll be there for all of them. And so I, it must have been 20-something years I did it. Yeah. I think one of them was 30 years. Yeah, and then you've been on Letterman like 100 times or oh something gosh. absurd like that. You've been yeah. in the White House multiple times. How would you know that? I went to the White House, yes. Yeah, I saw the picture of you and Bill, President Bill Clinton in the, in the White House. It's in the middle of this book, which, by the way, oh my everybody gosh. should read this book. Oh, my gosh. This is uh, that right there. Look at that. Jungle Jack. This is one of your many books. I have loved this book. Yeah. This, Okay, so one of the things in this book that was crazy was the day you got bit by an anaconda snake. And I think we have a photo of you with an anaconda. Or is that a boa constrictor right here? Yes. Is that, which one is that? No, that one there. No, that's the anaconda. Anaconda. Okay. Yeah. Tell a story about when you got bit. You almost lost your finger. Yes, I did. He got, he, I got it in the, in the mouth like this. And I went like this. And the guy grabbed my arm like this and said, stop, stop. You're going to lose your finger. When do you lose my finger? Don't worry. I don't think he's going to chop it in two, but you're going to pull your finger and pull your hand out. So he held it like that, you know, and, and he just opened his mouth up somehow with this, this little stick or something. Didn't hurt the animal, but it hurt me. <laughs> That's great. And it shredded all the skin off pretty much, but you almost yeah. lost it. Yeah. And it just really stemmed from you loving animals as a child. Yeah. Because one of the things we're talking about in the series, as you know, you, you and your wife are such faithful right now, church online, family, been watching every week. Your wife always sends me a text with her favorite points for my sermon. If I don't get that text, I feel like maybe I didn't preach good. So it's always really encouraging to get it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm encouraging people to get outside more, to be outside more, because that has really made your life more, more yes. beautiful, hasn't it? Yes. Oh, yes, it sure has. Even coming into Montana, it's, it's great for me when I hike up there, you know, and, and you get to see the animals. Um, we came across up there in the, in, in the park over there. In Glacier Park? He sure did. And came around that, that the thing where you walk down that core of the wall here and you go out. Is it the high foot. line? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. Where you fall off. 
came around that corner, and there it was, a bear with three babies. Oh, my from gosh. From me to that, right there, like about 10 feet was from us right there. Came around the corner like black this. Black or grizzly? Huh? Was it black bear or grizzly bear? Well, I think it was grizzly. Oh. But they were just sitting there with the baby. And I, and I, and I try and tell people this. And yes, if you want to carry your weapon, that's one thing. I don't know what the rules are anymore. All I know is, even if you, I was in the army, by the way, I had weapons. But Thank I you would for never, serving our country. I would never, you know, I did that in Vietnam. Anyway, the point is, I would never do that. What you take, folks, is spray. The spray will work. If you have some animal coming at you like that, you know, and you're trying to do a pistol, you hit him in the arm or something like that. It's making him mad. Exactly. It's going to be worse. So I tell everybody, wear your spray. I've used the spray before up there. When that daggum bear came around there with that, those kids, or the kids, the babies behind it, and I just went like it, and it was right in front of me. Did it work? Yeah, it worked. She went like this and walked away. Man. So that's what I try and tell people. Use a spray. Don't take a weapon. Just yeah. the spray is what you want to have. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a very good tip. I think we're people, more people in the pandemic have been getting outside, which is good, going yeah. to parks, which is good, yeah. but always bring that bear spray with you. Yeah, always do it. Man. It, it, now, you... Um, and your wife, uh, someone told me you, you guys were coming to Fresh Life, which I was like freaking out. I was like definitely having a fangirl moment when a childhood, someone I'd watched on TV as a child, I was told that you guys had been uh, coming to the church and it was so cool. I understand you uh, made a faith decision originally at a Billy Graham crusade, is that right? Yep, yep, wow. Billy Graham, yep. Where was that uh, crusade at? I think that was one in, uh, in uh, I think that was in Southern Montana somewhere, wow. yep. And, and do, you, do you recall how you felt when he was preaching or any memories of that moment when he was up there? Yeah, it was something. It really was. I got to see him too, yes. Wow. Oh, so, you got to meet him. Yeah. So that was something for me to do. Yes, it was. Oh, my gosh. It, I would love to do that again someday, but I haven't done it. Yeah. Well, he's in heaven now, and we'll get to see him soon yeah. one day. Yeah. Jenny and I got invited to get, spend a few moments with him after Lenny went to heaven, oh, really? our daughter, and come to his home and shake his hand and thank him. And we had a prayer together. Oh, it was wow. just so beautiful. What a man of God. He sure was. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Now, when we think about um, marriage, I know you're not only, you joked about your wife, obviously. 51 uh, your years. Favorite animal. 51 years of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> what have you learned about marriage in that time? In my marriage of 51 years? Yeah. Always agree with Sue. Always agree with <laughs> Sue. Now, is it true that a donkey was involved in you winning Sue's hand in marriage? Yes. Um, I went to school. My dad said, I said, Dad, I'm taking donk the donkey with me to, to my college. Which is normal. You bring but, your trapper keeper, your yeah, donkey. I fence. took my donkey up there and put him right next. Well, I got kicked out. I put him behind a fraternity, a fraternity building there. The guys that were so excited because I, I had just gone there. I was a freshman. They was, these were seniors. Oh, we'll take care of your donkey. Don't worry, Jack. I put the donkey behind their place here. The next day, what do you think? My first day in college, the president calls me in his office. Jack Hanna, you don't bring a donkey to college. You can't put him in the, he don't go to college here. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. So I had to leave. He, tell me, he didn't kick me out. He just said, you have to leave right now. I, I'm, I'll take care of it. So I went and got the donkey, and there was a farm right, kind of next door to the college. So I put my donkey right next door. And then, and then when I was in French class, I looked over there, and there was this beautiful girl sitting there. It's my wife, Susie, of 51 years now. I looked at her, I said, oh, hey, do you like animals? Sure. You want to see, can you see my donkey? She goes, see my donkey? What are you donkey? I brought the donkey to college. <laughs> sure, I'd love to go to see the donkey with you. So then I took Susie over there to see my donkey and I've been married to her 51 years. So my gosh, she's helped me raise every kind of animal on the planet earth. I mean, snakes, fish. At one point you had literal lion cubs in your home being oh, yes. raised in your house. Yes, I did, because I went to see Born Free. Because you kind of made your home into a zoo. Before you got to run a zoo, you turned your home into a zoo. Yes. Right? So you had lions. How did you know this? You're right. I mean, you talk I, about it in this book. This I is know, This I is know. an unbelievable You're right. book. I, I mean, also say, too, on the book subject, parents should get your kids' books. Especially those new homeschool parents, you don't know what you're doing. Jenny and I use all three of Jungle Jack's kids' books. They have facts about animals. They're fascinating. They're so well oh, done. Thanks. And then you can read the thing, and then you can go do a deep dive on that animal, which is really cool. Yep. But you had all these animals in your home. Yeah. And, and yes, because what, what the reason that is, because way back then when there were no rules, people were buying lions, all kinds of animals. You said you could buy them out of a mail-order catalog, and they would just oh, show you, up on your door? You're darn right, Yes. And you can order them, yes. And that, and that, was, that stuff got stopped in this country, too. Yeah, it probably because, should. Because I ended up with Hashtag a lot. Hashtag Tiger King. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. 
because people would call me up about these animals, you know. So then I went and got them and took care of myself, you know, and, and, and then try to tell people, you know, you can't just get a lion or a tiger and stuff like this, folks. It doesn't yeah. work that way. The babies are real Not cute. Not even if you have a mullet and an ear, a dangling earring. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about baby animals. These animals grow to be huge. And, that, and soon I had to take care of a lot of these animals that were big. A lot of the ones that got abandoned are the problem. Because exactly. people will just let them go when they get too Yes, they just let them go control. when they get big, yes. Yeah. And it's just, it's all illegal now. You can't hit them in this country. Which is good. But you're, you, long, long before all that, you know, became publicizing, but you were doing that in a, in a responsible way. And that, but that, what I love about that is, yes, you're this world-renowned zookeeper. Yes, you've been, you know, yep. all over the place. But it started with just a, a small love of animals, and that grew. And you, like, I think you talk about telling your college uh, president you wanted to be a zookeeper and him laughing at you. He should, how'd you know? Yeah, you're right, he did. Like, going to college, you'd be a zoo keeper or whatever. Yes, I want to be a zookeeper. And that's what it all ended up, you know, because they try, everybody tried to push me out of it. And when you first got your start, you had this little zoo, and then it was a Florida zoo, and then well, you're right. you got the job as the Columbus Zoo Director. Yes, you know, my first one was called Pet Kingdom. My brother had this little thing there selling stuff from a, you know, it was like a motel he bought, right? Exactly, correct. Yeah. I took the motel and turned it into my, my animals there. And that worked pretty good. <laughs> okay, so you so started little. And I like that because I think sometimes people get intimidated by a big dream, but they forget they need to start small. You yep. need to keep working at it. And yes. you did all the unglamorous stuff before David Letterman was calling and before James Corden was calling. You were doing just the small little things, taking care of animals, going right. out. Like, I, I think you talk about going to get the first elephants from New York. You flew into Kennedy. Oh, my and you, gosh. And you wedged the, the elephants into a bridge? Yes. The truck I got was too big. So the elephants came in from Africa, in the airport there. I put them in the this back of the New truck. This is New York City. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I've never been to New York City before, ever there. I've never been in there. Kid from the farms of Tennessee going to Manhattan to pick up two elephants. I know. It's a and great we, start buddy, to a story. And we put the elephants in the tr truck we had. And then what happens, I go back into the city there. And what happens, I get stuck in those tunnels they have out there. I've never been in a tunnel in my whole life. So it's too and, low. Yeah, it's too low. And this truck got stuck in the daggum tunnel. And all the cars were backed up for about 20 or 30 of them in less than 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, the police came phew, everywhere. And they go, what are you doing in here? Sir, I didn't know. I never lived here. I got my, I got my elephants in the truck. And they, got, they thought they were going to they really get mad at me. They said, knock it off. You ain't got no elephants in that truck. That's stupid. We've been here all of our lives. You're going to be in trouble, sir. Sir, I had the animals in here. Open that door. Opened up and the trunks came out like this. <laughs> they go, oh my God, you do have elephants in here. This is pretty good. I can, can I take a picture for my family? Yeah, please don't arrest me, please. No, we're not. This is cool. We never had elephants here in New York City. And they're stuck in a tunnel. <laughs> so then they had tra traffic backed up. I don't know how far. I know the people want to kill me. But, you know, that I, is hilarious. I didn't know I'd get stuck in a tunnel with an elephant. Who, who, who could ever count on such things? Yeah. Now, when you took over the, the position heading the, the, the Columbus Zoo, it's now world-renowned, but it yeah. was kind of dirty and, uh, and, yeah. and run down. And you, you, you and your family sort of led an, an initiative to, to lead by example, picking up trash yourself. Yeah, and, we sure did. All the girls, my wife Susie, after church on Sundays, we'd go around and pick up everything in the you know, paper on the ground at, at the zoo there. And that's where we all, all my kids were raised in the zoo there. We lived in the zoo. And then one time I was bitten by a beaver, like I said. And then the, as the, well, at the hospital. One time I was bitten by a beaver, like I said. I mean, that's just a great. It, yeah, yeah. And it really is funny now. But it wasn't funny when it happened. Because they said, I asked you where you lived on your paper there and also where you worked. I said, ma'am, I live in a zoo. You live in a zoo. She thought I was mentally ill. Now, this you, was again in New York City, right? Yes. You were on Letterman. You bought a beaver. Yep. It bit you. Yeah. So you ended up running out of the when I, when I walked the off, set. The, exactly, you're right. They tried to call an ambulance. I said, no way. So I, I went down to Roosevelt Hospital, about five blocks away in New York City, walking to the front door there. I had a jacket on. I took my jacket off, and sure enough, there's that nurse going, shooting victim, shooting victim. Because there's blood everywhere. Everywhere. and the people Because it was a vein there. or something? Yes. Oh, this, that whole thing. You see that whole thing there? You can see that dark stuff? The whole thing got tanged off. Don't get bit by a beaver. <laughs> And all these people Would are waiting. Would it be better to be bitten by a beaver or Justin Bieber? No, I was bitten by a real animal. Oh. I tore my hand off. But you said you did meet Justin Bieber. Yeah, I did meet him, yes. I met him, yes. Casual. <laughs> all the kids just woke up. Yeah, sorry. So you told the lady, I have not been shot. 
Yes, ma'am, I've been bitten by a beaver. Where? Well, I didn't say Central Park, even though it was around that area. It wasn't right there at the park. We don't have beavers in Central Park. <laughs> and she's sitting there talking to me. I said, ma'am, I'm bleeding to death right now. Look, I, it was my pet beaver, okay? Who cares about beaver? I'm just telling you the beaver bit me. I need help. But we never had a beaver bite here. Ma'am, please, I'm bleeding to death again. Okay, look at me. Oh my gosh, look at you. I thought you were shot. So then the doctors came in and said, I've never treated a beaver biter. A beaver bite? A beaver bite. <laughs> I don't know, sir. Just please, I don't want to die from some disease from a beaver. <laughs> so they gave me shots. They dig it out and they put a big old thing on top of it. Yeah. So then I got in the, got to the airplane. They told me to get home. He called the uh, he called a doctor in Columbus, Ohio, all the way from New York. This guy came in here, Jack Hand. Oh, I know who Jack is. Hand, I've heard of him over here. See him to my office real quick. So he took care of my beaver bite in Ohio. <laughs> That is hilarious. Now, um, I love your story because it's that story of, of small things done repeatedly, a passion leading to bigger opportunities, yep. your love of animals, love of people, has yep. taken you to all seven continents. Yep, uh, sure is there has. anywhere you haven't visited you'd like to go? Yeah, I, I want to, Sue and I, I've told Sue that I want to go back now instead of filming in all these, where I went all around the world, when you're filming, it's work, you know, and you can't, just, even though I'm, the animals are all behind me and everything, but you know, when I'm filming, I can't really get to see the animals myself and enjoy it. So one thing about Sue, what we want to do here in this future coming, because I'm- Because you're stepping back yes. as of this year as the director yes. of the zoo. I am, yes. Congratulations, new season. Yeah, 41 years. Yep. Amazing. December 1st, yep. And so that, and now I want to take Sue and go around the world and see some of these animals ourselves, you know, going out there and seeing them, uh, going in the oceans to go down and see them, go, go and see the ones in Africa, especially, yes, I love Africa, yes. Yeah. Uh, in Rwanda, especially where the mountain gorillas are. It's amazing. Yep. It's amazing. Uh, you have three kids, you have six grandkids, yeah. an incredible career behind you, and we believe a great future ahead of you. And I just want to honor you. Thank you. Uh, I, I know we teased that you're like our Montana grandparents, but uh, we really do just think so highly of you and, and you. God's work in your life. So thanks for being my That's friend. That's very nice. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, God, God bless, bless you, Jack. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, sir. Come on, let's hear from my friend Jack Hanna. What an amazing man he is. And I know it was just a little taste. You're like, come on, I want to hear the rest. I want to hear more from that guy. Uh, Jenny and I had the chance as well to sit down with Jack and his wife, Sue, and on a long format conversation on our podcast, Hey, It's the Lust Goes, you'll be able this week to listen to uh, a whole lot more of them. So check that out because it was a lot better than what we were able to cover just in that few minutes together. But basically, the idea is he has lived this life outside. He's lived this life with animals. And it has been so good for his soul. And he has seen that experience change the lives of people as through the zoo and his travels and TV shows and as he's brought animals onto, onto television shows. People have interacted with these creatures that they normally wouldn't see. And what it always does is impacts them. A animals impact us. They, they use horses in therapy. They use dolphins in therapy. There's something about the human spirit that's touched by coming into contact with creation. It's true with animals. It's, it's true with majestic things. It's even true when you take a simple walk in the park. Renowned architect Frank Lloyd Wright put it really well when he said, I go to nature every day for inspiration in the day's work. He found his, his, his ability to uh, put these. I mean, yeah, what a legend, by the way. Come on. You just look at that. That, that. They don't take photos like they used to. That's for day. That's my next, that's my next glossy 8 by 10 right there, right? Would you like to book this guy to preach at your next virtual, distant, socially responsible, eco-friendly, recycled event? All right, so, so Frank Lloyd Wright, what is he saying? He's saying, before I can feel like I can do what I'm supposed to do at work, I, I need to be in nature. I need to be inspired by it. I need to, what is he saying? I need to get outside, which is a cure for so many of the problems, or at least a component in it. You think about things that we're concerned about with kids, with child obesity and ADD, even things like uh, higher rates of, of, of nearsightedness and, and other issues. And, and study after study has shown that, that when kids are outside more, it impacts all of these things. As little as 20 minutes outdoors can help a child to have lower rates of, of ADHD and ADD. It just really has an has a impact on them. Just to be outside and get dirty and play, which it seems so simple and it seems so obvious, but it's something that's not being done. You know, you think about the fact that if you're incarcerated in a prison, you'll get about an hour outside a day. And that is unbelievable to think about what impact that would have on you, to have it regulated on you. 
your ability to go outside. But one study I came across recently shows that, on average, children in America today spend only four to seven minutes per day outside in unregulated free play. Four to seven minutes, which is to say that being a child in America, you get far less than half of what an inmate gets serving time in prison. Time outside, which is so good for you, which so impacts you. But flash forward from the time spent outside to time spent on a screen, and it's 12 hours for a child today. A young person today, they're 12 hours per day on a screen. And that's just to go to school. And then they get done with that, and then they're allowed to play on their iPod Touch, and then they're allowed to play on their devices. So, so much of, and that's an impact on the eyes, nearsightedness, they, they think is correlated with so much time on screens. We know posture is impacted. The social dilemma, yes, we all saw it on Netflix. It's screwing everybody up. It's screwing everything up. And it's just such a simple cure. Get outside, which, believe it or not, is exactly what James, the half-brother of Jesus, prescribes as a cure for a different problem that we face, the wars, the difficulties that go on. He's going to tell us we need to get outside. Look at James chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, we're just going to look at one quick verse just to see him set the content up. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Someone in the chat type, within you, within you, within you, within you. If you're at a watch party, just turn to someone next to you at your watch party and say, within you. And then say back to that person who said that to you, he's talking about you, right? I am 90% sure he's talking about you. Here's the thing you have to understand. James is addressing problems that were going on in the early church. Now, we tend to look back at that early church. Oh, it was so perfect back then. It was so wonderful back then. Well, here's James, one of the first books written in the New Testament we know, or first epistles written. And he's writing to Christians spread out among this early church. And he's needing to speak to issues present and notice he says, hey, do you guys want to know where all these wars are that are popping up among you, these things that are happening? Fights, he says, and quarrels. Interestingly enough, in the original Greek, the word quarrel actually is translated as presidential debate. Where do the, <laughs> is it funny? All right, too soon. All right, I'll let it go. Quarrels. Where do these fights, where does the turmoil, where does the tension, where does the, she's not talking to her anymore. Oh, and he left that group, and, and they don't talk. Where, where do these quarrels come from? He's, what is he needing to speak to? The relevant, pertinent issues that were going on at the day. He knows that they wanted him to speak into this issue. He knows that they, they craved his coverage. And he's saying, do you know what causes these quarrels among Christians, FYI? These fights among Christians, FYI, people who call themselves Jesus people. And remember, a great theme of this book is he's trying to get people who claim to be Jesus people but aren't living a beautiful life who claim to be heavenly minded but aren't doing anything uh, of, of any earthly good here on this planet, he's, he's trying to help them to see they need to align their, their profession with what's coming out in their daily procession, what's proceeding from their lives. And so he says, all right, you want to know what's causing all this? It's the evil desires, verse 1, at war within you. Interestingly enough, the first time he uses the word you, it's plural. You want to know where the quarrels come from among you? They come from within you. That's singular you. you, 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 you I know you're worried about the problems out there, but you, you need to know it's coming from the issues and the stink in here. So the solution to the problem in here is to get outside. Spoiler alert, before we go any further, let me just tell you where this message ends. This message ends with God's people flat on their face, humbling themselves in the sight of the Lord, that he may in due season lift them 
up. He's saying, I know you want the problem to be your sister. James, write this letter and tell my small group leader that they're the problem. Tell this person in the church, this person in my life, tell them that the problem is out there. Where do the, he's like, they're, they're going, where do the fights and, and wars and quarrels come from? Where does the contentiousness come from? Where do the difficulties, why is everyone so mean on Instagram? Where, where does this all come from out there? And he's going, no, you, the problem is in here. You need to get out Side. You need to get outside of your own little self and your own little perspective and your own little life. You think that you're good in here, and the problem's always out there. He's saying, no, get outside of that way of thinking. The problem is within you. The problem is within you. So while they want to know what's causing all this sin, he's pointing their attention to the sin beneath the sin. Jot that down, the sin beneath. There's always a sin beneath the sin. We were tempted to think about, oh, I, I got this issue. I got that issue. The, there's always an issue beneath the issue, an issue causing the issue, a deeper level. So, so he, he knows that they're like, why is everyone so mean? Why do I have problems with relationships? Why, why is that church not friendly? And he's like, you want to know what's really causing this? Verse 2, because you want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. <laughs> they're going to be so sorry they asked him to speak into their lives. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. But you can't get it, so you fight. And he says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, this is verse 3, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So tell us how it really is James. James is saying, I know you, you think the problem is this sin that you see, but there's deeper sin. There's sin beneath the sin. There's, there's things happening in your life you don't even realize. So the hatred is actually caused by the jealousy. If you cure the jealousy and work on the jealousy, it'll deal with the hate-filled behavior. It'll deal with the meanness in your spirit. I know you're, you're, you're frustrated because everything always evolves into, into a fight. And being around each other is unpleasant. He's saying it's actually being caused by envious over here that's driving that acting out over there. He's saying the problem is because your envy, it causes you to not enjoy what you have. And what you don't have that you could have, the sin beneath that sin is prayerlessness. Because if you would pray for what you wished you had, you would have it. And then you wouldn't be frustrated by what you don't have because you would be looking at what you do have that God gave you to have instead of what your neighbor has that God chose to give them. So it's not the sin that's the problem. It's not the, the out there that's the problem. The problem's in here. And if we can get out there and get outside of ourselves and see past ourselves and let God speak to us, he'll show us the reason we didn't receive what we wish we had about the things that we prayed for is because we were selfishly motivated when we were praying them. So he's opening up our eyes. We're getting outside of ourselves to get a little perspective and see the sin beneath the sin. Where does the problems in the world come from? Why are we living in such a divided time? Why is it even an issue like, 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 like the mask and all these? Why, why is it all the, all the cantankerousness, all of it's being caused by the brokenness inside the human heart? What, what, is, what, what does sin come from? Well, sin comes from James chapter 1, verse 14, when everyone's tempted, drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Or as the message puts that verse very vividly, lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. What is he saying? He's saying that when we look to these big things that show up, they're caused by itty bitty little compromises, itty bitty little mistakes. And that's because you need to know this about sin. Sin always camouflages itself. I wore the appropriate shirt today. Sin camouflages. It, it hides itself. It, it disguises itself. It makes itself seem smaller than it is. You, 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 you would recognize the big, full-blown manifestations, but you don't recognize where these things started. These little things, these little thoughts, these little patterns, these little habits. He's saying there's a sin beneath the sin. Sin not only camouflages itself, but it also sandbags. You know, sand, have, you ever, have you ever played sports with a sandbagger? Who, oh, I haven't played basketball since high school. 
You know, I don't is this a, is this a ball? I mean, I don't even remember. And they get out there and you're like, you're kind of like, mom, I'm gonna, you know, I play a little bit, you know, and then they're just like, they trounce you. Like, it's always a warning sign when someone talks about how long it's been. Oh, man, I'm real rusty. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Sin sandbags, that's what it does. It's like, oh, it's going to be fine. I, I haven't done this in a while. It's going to be totally good. This will feel good. This will, this will, this will medicate the, 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 the other thought that you're, you're not wanting to think about. That's how sin is. It camouflages. It sandbags. But then what does it do? Lastly, it mushrooms. Sin, sin always snowballs. Sin always escalates. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go and keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Sin always gets unwieldy, always gets out of control. It was if they could scan backwards. It was years ago when they just started those little envious thoughts, started those, those little jealous thoughts. We're nursing those little things. It was that that led to the big fights. So now they're bringing the fighting on. What's the cause of the fight? He goes, you got to go back a couple years when you allowed that toxic thinking. You got to scan back a little bit when you allowed your, your, your frame of reference to be dominated by culture instead of dominated by God's word. It, it, it came down to who you called when you got broken up with to get advice to speak into your life. Did you call a godly voice? It calls to, it, it, James is saying it's the sin beneath the sin. I know you want me to fix this over here, but it might not even be, the problem might not even be in your neck. It might be lower back that's radiating up your neck. You got to find the sin beneath the sin. And that's why there's so much brokenness, he's saying. It's inside. So the solution can't be fixed internally. You have to have an external solution. God has to fix it. It has to come from outside. He's saying you got to get outside. The answers are not within. The problem is within. We need the answer to be without. Come on, and thanks be to God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, who was outside but chose to come inside our planet, inside our world, and bring us salvation. And through his spirit, we have help. And that's the second point, the spirit who won't stop. Yes, there's sin beneath the sin. But fortunately, despite our messiness and our brokenness, we have been given the Holy Spirit who won't stop. Now, it's going to get worse before it gets better, OK? So I'm gonna, you're going to get encouraged in just a minute. But first, this will discourage you more. Just buyer beware. James is mad. Verse 4, you adulterers. Oh my gosh. That's intense, right? How to win friends and influence people by James. <laughs> you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate. He placed the spirit within you that it should be faithful to him. All right, what's happening here? What's happening here? What's happening here? Again, they wanted him to speak into why is all this messed up out there? And James is saying the problem's in here. The problem comes to, at its core, a lack of loyalty in your heart before God, that you're not loyal to God. Your heart is divided. It's literally what he said earlier, double-minded. The unstable man can't expect to, to grow in his relationship with God. If you're double-minded, if you care about, about God and this, it's going to divide your focus. It's going to divide your soul. What we want to be is upright towards God. We want to be single-souled before him. To have that as our undivided passion, that we, that we look to him with, with just one eye, with just one focus. But none of us do that. We all essentially cheat on God, caring about other things more than we care about God. We, we end up divided. We end up, we end up being spiritual adulterers. And we would think, well, God's got to be so mad that we would cheat on him. But that's exactly why I wanted to tell you that he's the spirit who won't stop. Because just as we start feeling like, oh, I'm the worst. I'm cheated on God. I've cared about other things more than God. I, I haven't lived for him. He must want nothing to do with me. We read verse 6 when it says, and he gives grace generously. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Y'all, I want you to understand that in response to you and I compromising and making mistakes and, and flirting with temptation and inviting outright sin into our lives and, and opening up the, 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 the link we shouldn't have opened up, all of the things that we do that divide our focus away from God, divide our intensity away from him. In response to him sending his son to die for us, we say thank you so much, but then we end up compromising and making these mistakes. And it says, what's God's response? 
he gives more grace. That, that verse, I, want, I just encourage you to memorize it, write it down. When you think about yourself as a failure, just remember, and he gives more grace. And he gives more grace. And he gives more grace. The Amplified makes it even more beautiful because it shows that in the original language, it's, but, the, but, but he gives us more and more grace. He gives us more and more grace. Because you think, well, I'm such a failure. I'm such a screw up. I'm, I've, I've made so many mistakes. But he gives more and more grace. And he gives more and more grace. I just want to encourage you right now. He sees you. He knows your name. He loves you. And what is the Spirit wanting to do? He wants to give you more grace. He's got grace for your failures. He's got grace for your messes. He's got grace for your sin. He's got, he's got grace for the fact that you get stuck inside. And you get inward focused, and you forget about other people, and you forget about Jesus, and you end up just discouraged, and you become a victim. So what's he doing? He's not there with his arms crossed. He's there with more grace. But he gives more grace. Come on, I want this Sunday to encourage you that God right now, he's looking to give you more grace. He wants to pour more grace out upon you, wants to encourage you, wants you to seek him. And that is the secret to standing tall. A third, just this quick message. The secret to standing tall. The, de the de dictionary definition of stand tall is to stand with your back straight and your head raised, ready to deal with anything. I believe, if I believe anything, the spirit who can't stop pouring out grace, but he gives more grace, but he gives more grace, but he gives more grace. He gives that grace that you might learn to stand tall with your back straight and your head raised, ready to deal with anything. So how do you get there? Million dollar question. James is going to tell us the secret is verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. We've gotten good at that, haven't we? Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. So there you have it, the secret to standing tall. Let me take those verses and, and put them in just a few buckets. The first is get lost. Get lost. That's one of the beautiful things about being in nature. And I don't mean actually lost, bring a compass, text a friend, get a GPS. All, all, I don't mean really get lost. I mean lost in the sense that you're just caught up in the moment, off the screen, eyes up. It's amazing what can happen. I came across a, an article in Psychology Today, and the title arrested me. The title was The Power of Awe. That's a, that's a good title, The Power of Awe. And this was a study from the University of California that was talking about how the feeling of awe is, has been correlated uh, not only with lower sense of stress, which we talked a little bit about how good it is for your, your body, how, how you feel happier, how you feel more productive, how there's actually a, a raft of health benefits to being outside more, uh, to being uh, in nature. But, but they were saying that it not only does those things, but it also has been proven to help with creativity, empathy, and generosity. And then it said that this not only is something that can come from being specifically in the woods or in the Grand Canyon or out in nature, but also has been linked to the experience that comes from looking at art and also being in a religious environment. And that there's something that comes. What they said, the big thing you have to be around is something bigger than you. That when you're on something bigger than you, it just makes you more creative. That's the Frank Lloyd Wright thing. I go design a building now because I've seen something bigger than me, something more majestic than me. I mean, behind me on the screen is, is, is the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone National Park. And these falls and this image was painted back in the day. And the painting made its way east. And the painting of this scene was one of the things that caused them to want to make Yellowstone the first national park out of the entire national park system that would come spilling out of that. It wasn't even the actual thing itself. It was just a painting being delivered to people who had never seen anything like this before. And that feeling caused them to need to want to protect things, just seeing a glimpse of a painting of it. And, and that's, that's the power 
of awe. And that's what James is saying. You and I live this way, and we just tend to complain, and, and this, and, and my life's hard, and it's so bad. And, and I'm, we, we kind of get into these, these, these loops. Why is it that 50% of young people have some sort of mental health battle they're facing? I would say partially it's about this four to seven minutes of free time outside, and partially it's about this 12 hours of screens. And yes, the single parent home, and yes, other things that we can point to, but we need more awe. We need more awe. We need more awe, and not just the awe that comes from nature, awe that comes from being face to face with the God who breathed out nature, the God who created creation. It's, it's, not just, it's not just nature for nature's sake. It's, there's a benefit to that. There's, there's good that comes from that. And, and there's not just the power of religion, the power of art. It's, it's, it's realizing the reason those things resonate, the reason those things reverberate, is because the one who made those things also made you. He made you to interact in his creation in that way. We need more awe. So we need to get lost. We need a sense of, of I'm, I'm humbling myself before God. He's high and he's lifted up. There's nails through Jesus's hands. And those were there inflicted by love for you and for me. And the God who made all that and did all that also has your name on his hand and cares about you and wants to meet with you, wants to know you, wants to love you, wants to walk with you, wants to woo you, wants to be in a relationship so committed that when you, when you give your allegiance to other things, it would be described as adultery because he loves you like that. There's not a greater love. Get lost in his love. You'll find creativity flowing. You'll find empathy flowing. You'll find generosity flowing. Those quarrels and fights and wars, you'll just watch them just be absorbed as you lose yourself in a bigger story. Get lost. Submit. Come under that authority. That's what that word submit means. Come under the authority of one. It's hupotasso in the Greek. It literally means to arrange yourself under. James is saying, humble yourself under his authority. Be in awe before someone bigger than you. He is God in heaven. We are here on earth. Let us have our words be few and just to be in awe, a holy fear of him. So get lost. Secondly, we need to get reps. Get reps at what? Get reps at overcoming temptation. He says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What a powerful thought. The, de the devil doesn't want you to know this, that if you resist him, he has no choice but to flee from you. The Bible says that God has appointed a, a way of escape in every temptation. The enemy wants us to think like we have no option. We have no option and our, our pulse races. But we have to, in that moment, say, stop. God has promised in every temptation there's a way of escape. There's a way out. And so in taking it, he has no choice but to back off, to, to back down. And so what does that mean then? That means then that there's power to overcoming temptation in overcoming temptation. Because when it works, you have a proof of concept. When it works, you have a precedent. When you don't back down tomorrow, you get to remember, yesterday, I didn't back down. I stood my ground, right? I, I hyper stood. And then I have that muscle memory that it worked and that he had to back down. I resisted the devil, and he fleed before me. And so I'm going to think about that next time. And I have confidence. And I can get into a groove. What does that mean? That means this, that sin mushrooms, yes. But so does righteousness, and so does kindness, and so does love. I know we talk a lot about bad addictions, like our phone and, and other things that we get addicted to. But what about the good addictions? What about the I did the right thing, and it gave me some courage? What about the I read my Bible yesterday, and God encouraged me, so I'm going to do it again tomorrow? What about the I began 2020 with a fast, and God tucked some things in my life, so you know what? I'm going to remember the power of prayer and fasting. What about the 
I called on God and he delivered me and he's my fortress and he hid me under the shadow of his wing and I developed that and I remembered that and I can enlarge that. If he did it there, he can do it again. If he got us through that, he can get us through this. I resisted the devil. He had to flee from me. So you know what? Satan's going to have to back down because mightier is the one who's in me than he who is in the world. I'm talking about the power of getting some reps. I'm talking about the power of this isn't going to always be my first time through. Sometimes when you walk with God, it's so clumsy. And so the problem is you think it's always going to be that hard. But if you'll just keep doing it and you'll just keep going in it, new problems will surface. I'm not trying to say you'll just get this thing licked and it'll be no big deal. You're always going to need muscle confusion. And so God's always going to make sure and mix things up, because otherwise you wouldn't need faith and you wouldn't need him. But the reality is you're going to be able to call upon past experiences and be able to historically point to God's faithfulness and pull it out. It's the power of getting some reps. Y'all, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm able to think back on difficult days and dark days and say, God was there then, and he's here now. Get reps. Thirdly, get serious. Get serious. This is what James is talking about when he's like, you know, let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter. What is he saying? He's saying, don't be so glib about this all. If you, if you really realize that God feels at times like we cheated on him and his response is to give more grace, that shouldn't make you cavalier like, oh, well, no big deal then. He'll just forgive me next time too. It should break your heart. It should break my heart. And that sorrow, that, that seriousness about it all should be a powerful tool of motivation, not of guilt. God doesn't want us to feel that way out of, out of like, oh, I'm so horrible. I'm such the worst. It's, man, he's so good. I want to grow. I don't want to hurt him like that again. I want to live a life of fear and awe before you. I want to get serious. I wrote these three questions down. What if you really thought God wanted to meet with you tomorrow morning? How would you show up for it? You, you, you'd be there early. If God really wanted to, like when you open your soap journal on Monday morning to have this time with him or Monday night, if you really thought he was there to speak with you, to, to you through his word, wouldn't that change your posture? Then I don't know, we'll see if this works. I don't know, this, we'll see if I get anything out of this. Like if you really thought God was there on the other side of that cup of coffee to meet with you. Wow. Second question I wrote down, what if you really thought God was listening to you when you prayed? Wouldn't that just change how you pray? Wouldn't it just change how you talk to him, how you convert, if you really thought he was there? What if you truly believed God wanted to reward those who diligently sought him? Get serious. Let's, 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 let's think about this in terms of he really is there. He's with you. He's going to be with you as you walk the streets of this world. He's going to be with you every waking moment. And when you die and stand before him, he's going to be there, the first face you see, to greet you into paradise. So get serious. And then finally, get together. Get together. This is really important. In verse 7, he once again reopens it back up to the plural. We started plural. Where do the fights come from? Then we went singular. They come from your dang broken, janky self. So get outside of yourself and, and have a bigger perspective. But he ends back on the plural. He says, so humble yourselves before God. Humble yourselves before God. What is he saying? The problem in a faith community comes from the broken, sinful things inside of the individual, but the solution has to once again happen in the community. Humble yourselves in God's sight, and you will watch him exalt you. What does that mean? That means that we need to be planted in the house of God. That means we need to be living this Christian life in cooperation, not in isolation. That's the power of being in a small group, even if it has to happen over Zoom. That's the power of being connected in a watch party. That's the power of getting people together to discuss the message. That's the power of giving people permission to call you out on things they see in your life that are holding you back. That's the power of having someone you can text when you're having a low moment. That's the power of having someone who you're sending verses to, and they're sending verses to you, and they're they're checking in on you. I'm telling you, if we're going to get outside, we need to do it together because you can't become yourself by yourself. The version of you that you're meant to be is something that has to happen all together with not just you, but us and we. Come on, someone. We need each other in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. 
We thank you for your love. And we thank you for what happens when we comprehend the power and majesty of your love. That the God who could create the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone knows what we ate for breakfast and wants to comfort us tonight as we fall asleep. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just right there as we're praying, I want you just to really feel a great sense of holy shrinking inside your soul. Feel how small you are, and yet feel how loved you are. Rejoice in the presence of majesty, a king who's who's so terrible and so large and yet so, so humble and so loving and so willing to condescend to help us, to guide us. You are our guide and our God even to the end. And so, Jesus, we commit ourselves to you. Help us to walk with you truly, authentically. And for anybody watching and listening, I pray if they don't know you, you would draw them to yourself, that even now would be that closure moment of trusting you for salvation because of what Jesus did on the cross and in rising from the dead. You can be saved if you put your faith in him. And I pray you would even now. You could just say something like, dear God, save me, forgive me, make me yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. God bless you so much.